All right, today I'm going to talk to you about the past, present, and future of the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. Okay, I'm talking about physical people, a kindred of people, okay, the Jews. And um, there's been a lot of controversy recently because of this false prophet, Stephen Anderson, and he's come out and openly attacking the Jews. And of course, he's just one in a, in a long line of uh, heretics that believe in replacement theology which we're going to be debunking today. I'm going to show you from the King James Bible replacement theology is a her heresy, a very serious heresy. I'm going to show you that God's not done with the Jewish people from the King James Bible. It's going to be a lot of scripture. And, um, but it's, you know, people ask, why do you pick on Stephen Anderson? Well, I, I pick on anybody that, that is teaching false doctrine. And, you know, again, let me just explain something. If you haven't seen the video on exposing false prophets um, that I did, one of the reasons that you expose false prophets and false teaching is to teach people how they can debunk that system themselves. Okay, if I'm just preaching truth, 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 and never show you how to actually engage a certain type of an enemy spiritually in combat, you know, I'm not really doing a very good job. Um, Paul warned the early Christians about false prophets quite a bit. See, you can teach doctrine through warning about false prophets. That's why I do that. A lot of what I've learned uh, came from preachers and teachers that exposed false prophets. And you can learn, oh, okay, that's how you would, you know, rebut that attack on whoever, on whatever Bible doctrine. That's why I'm doing this study. Okay, that's why I do this, the videos about Stephen Anderson. And I'm going to show you today that there's another reason why I make these videos against Stephen Anderson. Because replacement theology brings the curse of God upon a nation. And we're going to see that in this study. So what was the first prophetic reference to the Jewish people? Okay. Genesis chapter 3. Turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to see the very first prophetic reference to the Jewish people. Genesis chapter 3 verse 14. Okay. It says here, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed, Above all cattle and above every beast of the field upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What's this prophecy about? It's about Jesus Christ. It's about God being manifest in the flesh one day. And that that would be the, the ultimate blood atonement that would pay for the sins of mankind salvation would come through God being manifest in the flesh, okay, the seed of the woman. Now, obviously, Eve is the mother of all living. So you could say at this point in time, well, how is that a prophecy of the Jewish people? And at this point in time, it's not really a clear prophecy of the Jewish people. But it becomes more clear as you continue through the Bible. And you'll see that God actually starts to choose that one certain kindred. Go next to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Okay, it says here, Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son, son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, now look at this, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell on the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Okay, so you see three sons, right? Something happened between the time of Adam and Eve in the garden, and now there are three sons. And these three sons represent the three basic kindreds of people, okay? And there are a lot of branches within those three basic kindreds. That's why in the New Testament, when Jesus is crucified on the cross, there is three different languages... This is the, you know, about the king of the Jews. There are three different languages. Why? Representing the three different kindreds. And I use the word kindred because race is not a Bible word. And I have another study on that if you want to watch that. But the fact is, there are three kindreds. Okay? You have Shem, Ham, Japheth. All right? Japheth is the father of the white Europeans. Ham is the father of the uh, Arabic um, black Africans, basically. The Arabic people and the African people. And... Shem is the father of the Orientals and of the Jews. Okay? 
But it's a prophecy there, by the way, that Noah spoke. He said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. He didn't say that about either of the other two sons there, Japheth or Ham. Go to Luke, excuse me, Luke chapter 3. You say, how does this tie into the New Testament? That's in the Old Testament. How does this, why is this relevant? Well, I'm going to show you. Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 and verse, what do we have here? 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. Okay, and you can go down through this whole list. We're not going to read the whole thing, but you can go down through there. Jesus was born into a specific kindred of people. You say, what was that kindred? Well, we're going to see who it traces back to. Jump down to verse 34, which was the son of Jacob, which was the son of Isaac, which was the son of Abraham, which was the son of Therah, which was the son of Nacor, which was the son of Saruk, which was the son of Regu, which was the son of Phalak, which was the son of Heber, which was the son of Selah, which was the son of Cainan, which was the son of Arphaxad, which was the son of Sem. You say, who's that? Keep reading. Which was the son of Noe, which was the son of Lamech. So, Sem there, you're coming from Greek to English, and in the Old Testament would have been Hebrew to English, so it's spelled Shem in the Old Testament, Sem in the New Testament. But you see there, Sem. And Noah in the Old Testament, Noe in the New Testament. All right, verse 37, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Malaleel, which was the son of Cainan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam. Now look at this, another important scripture here, which was the son of God. Adam was the son of God. You say, wait a second, I thought Jesus was the son of God. There are two sons of God. Jesus is the begotten son of God. Adam is the created son of God. A lot of neat parallels between the two. How Adam died for his bride, Eve. Jesus Christ died for his bride, the church. Interesting. Adam uh, had a rib taken out of his side. Jesus was wounded in the side with a spear. Hmm. Very interesting. And there's a lot more I could talk about there. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 if you want more on that. The first Adam and the second Adam. But... Uh, Going back to what we are, the point here we're trying to originally make here, verse 36, Shem there, or Sem here in the New Testament, that when you see the prophecy back in Genesis chapter 9, where it says, blessed be the Lord God of Shem, right there you have it. Jesus Christ, this is his genealogy. Now, if God doesn't care about kindreds and things like that, uh, why would he make a whole, almost a whole chapter here, dedicate almost a whole chapter to that situation, the bloodline of where the kindred that Jesus Christ was born into. You know, people say, well, yes, but, you know, God was the father of Jesus Christ. Well, yes, I know that. But when Jesus Christ came here to the earth, he had to have a certain kindred. He was part of a certain kindred. And it was the Jewish people. Now, I'm going to just tell you right up front here, part of the, the whole big confusion that these replacement theology heretics will do they will blur the lines of distinction between the physical promises to this line of people, the Jewish people. They will blur the physical with the spiritual. Okay, They do that every single time. There are places where the Bible is speaking spiritually about inheritance, certain things that they, that this, you know, the seed of Abraham, that they get spiritual promises. And you're born into that as, by spirit of adoption as a Christian. They'll blur that with physical promises that are made to the Jewish people. That's where the whole confusion you know, is at. Now they'll say, well, yes, we believe that Jesus was you know, of the physical seed of, of Abraham there. He was a physical Jew, but now today we're spiritual Jews and the physical Jews are no more and all this satanic nonsense. I want to show you why it's satanic here as we get into this study. But next, let's go to... Genesis 15. Actually, we'll go to Genesis chapter 12. I just remembered there was a one I did want to cover here. Um, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 
Genesis 12, verse 1 through 3. It says here, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay? So there's a special blessing and a special, uh, not so much special, but a, a real true cursing that also comes on people that curse this particular bloodline. We're going to see about that. And of course, if you read there in Luke chapter 3, you saw what that bloodline was. That goes back to Shem. And if you are of Japheth and if you are of Ham, you know, if you're one of those, uh, you're not part of the bloodline of Shem, the physical bloodline. And we're going to see that there is a distinction about that in the New Testament, in the Pauline epistles for Christians today. There's a distinction between physical Jews and uh, Gentiles. We're going to see about that. Okay. Genesis chapter 15. We'll go next to Genesis 15 here. We're going to see a similar thing as to what happened over there in Genesis chapter 12. Okay, it says here, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Okay? So you see there, God gives a specific prophecy to Abraham that he is going to actually have a physical seed, a physical son, and that that son is going to be the father of a great nation. All right, go down to verse 18. And uh, we're not going to, you can read the, the thing there, how that the Lord actually makes this, you know, tells Abram to sacrifice these different animals and things, and then he comes down and he makes a covenant with him. But uh, verse 18 it says here, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, or sorry, Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Kadamites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. All right. Um, does Israel have that land today? No. I mean, you draw that thing out there where it says about... Uh, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. That's not the land that the nation of Israel has today. Okay? And uh, the nation of Israel never had that land. They never had all that complete whole area there. All right? And when they did have land, it was constantly being taken and, and fought over and, and everything else. Now, God made an everlasting covenant Okay, he made this covenant with Abram, and we're going to see that it is everlasting. We're going to see that. But he made this covenant with Abram for physical land. Hmm. Very interesting. Turn next to Genesis chapter 17. See, because the, the uh, replacement theology people try to say, well, it's just, you know, we, we're the ones that get everything now. We're, we took over. The Jews are no more. We replaced the nation of Israel. Well, if that's true, then why aren't you fighting for the land over there? The covenant that God made with Abram was for physical land. Why aren't you over there fighting for it? Let's continue. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. 
and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting, everlasting, did you get that word? Covenant. Because replacement theology heretics don't get the word everlasting. They just say, well, it was until the, the New Testament where they rejected Jesus Christ nationally and then, and then the covenant just kind of went away. <laughs> or it was switched to the spiritual Jews. Nutty. But let's continue. To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. Okay, now there's a bunch of things in there that you need to understand. Okay, first of all, the covenant is temporary till the fulfillment of the New Testament. No, it's everlasting. Okay, so when you have somebody say, well, you know, that, yeah, that Abrahamic covenant, you know, it just kind of went away because the Jews rejected Jesus Christ. You know what that person is doing? They're calling God a liar. I mean, when God makes a promise and he says it's everlasting, you can pretty much rest assured that everlasting in God's terminology means everlasting. You know, I mean, maybe we should look at the original Hebrew word meaning and everything. No, you should just believe the English text that you have in front of you. You know, if something is so, you don't need to change the King James Bible to prove it so. Watch out for these people that go to the original languages, you know. Look out for that. Notice, secondly, the covenant is to physical descendants, not spiritual. His seed. It's talking about physical descendants there. You say, well, no, that was an early reference to the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a mystery. It's not even been revealed yet. You go into the four Gospels and Jesus is saying, he's signifying what death he should die. And they're going, huh? Be it far from thee, Lord. No, I don't know what, you know. And even after Jesus dies on the cross, comes up from the dead, and he's walking with the disciples, he's explaining to them about what's supposed to happen here, what, you know, why he died on the cross and rose from the dead. And they're still going, I don't understand it. I don't get it. You know, I'm, I'm going to be doing a sermon on that in the future because I just need to get it done so it's part of the sermon, you know, um, whatever you call it here, you know, one of the sermons I can point people to. But the fact of this this lie that the disciples were look, saved by looking forward to the cross, that that is such a, a bunch of nonsense. That is not true. They were not saved by looking forward to the cross. Okay, the cross was a mystery. Even when Jesus was physically on the earth, even when he died on the cross, they were still doubting what it meant. So don't fall for that lie. Thirdly, though, physical circumcision is done as a token of the covenant. That's also going to be important later on. And the fourth thing is the covenant is for physical land. That's what you're reading there in Genesis chapter 17. The covenant is made with a physical man for physical descendants for a physical piece of real estate. There's nothing spiritual to it. This is not some kind of a spiritualized passage where we can spiritualize things that we don't understand, you know, like the Catholics do. And that's what they do. Again, I'm not, I'm not, you know, people go, oh, you're slandering, you're, you're slandering a brother in Christ when you attack Stephen Anderson and say he's spiritualizing things and whatever. No, I'm using actual documented facts here. The Catholics spiritualize things that they can't understand. That's what they do. The book of Revelation, it's spiritual. It's poetic. It's, it's, it's not literal. No, 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 no. Uh, that stuff all was going on in the first century, and, and John just thought he'd kind of write poetically about it. This pretty little poem or something like this. They spiritualize it. And when there's things that are spiritual, like the thing of Jesus saying, you know, eating my flesh and drinking my blood, and then, you know, 
uh, the, the flesh profiteth nothing, it's the spirit that quickeneth, you know. He talks about that. When he's obviously talking spiritually, then the Catholics say, oh no, it's literal. Why? Well, because Catholics are lost people, they don't have the Holy Spirit, and they're trying to interpret the Bible as lost people. That's why they make a mess of it. Interesting. Spiritualizing literal things and literal passages, they, you know, turn that into spiritual. So, but let's continue. Genesis chapter 26. Genesis 26, verse 1. And of course, you know, you read the whole Bible. You know, again, this book is a Jewish book. It's about the nation of Israel. Okay? And their king. That's what we're going to see about. Genesis chapter 26, verses 1 through 5. It says here, And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For, with, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. So again, the covenant didn't die out with Abraham. It continued on to Isaac. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Yeah. So the covenant is passed on to Isaac, the son of Abraham. Go next to Genesis 27, verse 26 through 29. It says here, And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near, and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment, and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be every one that curseth thee. And blessed be he that blesseth thee. Here Isaac is blessing his son Jacob. And he's repeating that same blessing that God talked about to Abraham. A blessing coming on those that bless that physical line. And a curse coming on those who curse that physical line. You say, no, but I know it's, it's spiritual. Because you see here in Romans, the book of Romans, the book of Romans isn't written about yet. Okay. Take things in their proper context, you know. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you don't study and if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you will make a fool of yourself and your ministry will be very foolish. You will be a workman that needs to be ashamed. Just exactly like Stephen Anderson and his cult following. Now, you say, what, I don't know about this curse thing, though, Brian. That's kind of a you know, medieval you know, curses put on people and stuff like this. Let's look about that. I have here an article. Um, Natural disasters are part of how God raises and lowers nations so that people would look to Him. And it's talking about here in Israel. Major acts of God that coincided with the timing of U.S. pressure on Israel to give up their land. Not on Israel to get saved. They're not, this, this isn't, you know, presidents of the United States saying to Israel, you need to accept Jesus as your Messiah. You're apostate. You're wicked right now. That isn't it. They're saying you need to give up some of your land. And what happens as a result afterwards? You say, well, I, I don't know about that. People, we're dealing with documented facts here. Okay? October 30th of 1991. President George Bush opens the Madrid Conference with an initiative for a Middle East peace plan involving Israel's land. On the same day, an extremely rare storm forms off the coast of Nova Scotia. It was eventually tagged The Perfect Storm, and a book and a movie were made about it. Record-setting 100-foot waves form at sea and pound the New England coast, even causing heavy damage to President Bush's home in Kennebunkport, Maine. Excuse me. Okay. Hmm, that's a coincidence, though. August 23, 1992. 
the Madrid Conference moves to Washington, D.C., and the peace talks resume, lasting four days. On that same day, Hurricane Andrew, the worst natural disaster ever to hit America, produces an estimated $30 billion in damage and leaves 180,000 people homeless in Florida. Another coincidence. January 16, 1994, President Clinton meets with Syria's President Hafiz el-Assad in Geneva. They talk about a peace agreement with Israel that includes giving up the Golan Heights. Less than 24 hours later, a powerful 6.9 earthquake rocks Southern California. The quake centered in Northridge is the second most destructive natural disaster to hit the United States behind Hurricane Andrew at the time. Okay, March 1st to April 1997, the combination of PLO, PLO Chairman Yasser Arafat touring America and Clinton rebuking Israel for not giving away her land for peace coincide with some of the most some of the worst tornadoes and flooding in US history. On the very day Arafat lands in America, powerful tornadoes devastate huge sections of the nation, ripping across Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Arafat's American tour also coincides with the storms in the D Dakotas, which result in the worst flooding of this century in addition to weeks of major storms throughout the Midwest. September 27th through 28, 1998. Clinton meets with Arafat and Netanyahu at the White House to finalize the land deal in which Israel will give up 13% of Yesha. Later, Arafat addresses the United Nations about declaring an independent Palestinian state by May of 1999, while Hurricane George's 110 mile an hour winds and gusts up to 175 miles an hour pounds the Gulf Coast, causing $1 billion in damage. At the exact time Arafat departs the U.S., the storm begins to dissipate. Coincidental, I'm sure. I mean, it's all just coincidence. October 15th through the 22nd of 1998. On October 15th, 1998, Yasser Arafat and Benjamin Netanyahu meet in Maryland to continue the talks begun in September. The talks are scheduled to last five days with a focus on Israel giving up the 13% of Yesha, which is Judah and Samaria, the talks are extended and conclude on October the 23rd. On October 17th, awesome rains and tornadoes hit southern Texas. The San Antonio area is deluged, deluged with 20 inches of rain in one day. Hmm. The rains and floods in Texas continue until October 22nd and then subside. The floods ravage 25% of Texas and leave over $1 billion in damage. On October 21st, Clinton declares this section of Texas a major disaster area. May 3rd of 1999. This is the same day in Israel that Yasser Arafat is scheduled to declare a Palestinian state with Jerusalem as the capital. The declaration is postponed to December 1999 at the request of President Clinton, whose letter to Arafat encourages him for his aspirations for his own land. He also writes that the Palestinians have a right to determine their own future on their own land and that they deserve to, quote, live free today, tomorrow, and forever. It's not the Palestinians' land. It's the Jews' land. You say, says who? The God of the Bible? You want to go against him? Anyhow, continuing here, it says, The same day, starting at 4.47 p.m., uh, the most powerful tornado storm system ever to hit the United States sweeps across Oklahoma and Kansas. The winds are clocked at 316 miles an hour, the fastest wind speed ever recorded. August 29, 2005, Israel's Prime Minister Ariel Sharon uh, completed the forcible eviction of Jewish settlers from the Gaza Strip. President Bush supported Sharon's evacuation from Gaza. He said, I strongly support his courageous initiative to disengage from Gaza and part of the West Bank. Exactly one week later, Hurricane Katrina struck the states of Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. 80% of the entire city of New Orleans was left underwater. If you remember any of that stuff, it was bad. Uh, many weather experts called this the worst hurricane and natural disaster that ever hit the country. Hmm. May 20th, 2011. Friday. President Obama demands that Israel return to 1967 borders. The Joplin tornadoes strike by Sunday, May the 22nd. Interesting. 
By Tuesday, the death toll in Joplin had reached 124, making it the single deadliest tornado since the National Weather Service began keeping such records 61 years ago. The tornado in Joplin brought the number of people who have died in U.S. tornadoes to 489 so far that year. The figure could escalate as rescue workers continue digging through rubble from Sunday's tornado in Joplin, Missouri. The deadliest tornado year on record is 1925, which had 794 deaths, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The number of fatalities so far this year is more than eight and a half times the average number for an entire year, 56 according to CNN meteorologist, I'll get it out, (laughs) Chad Myers. Hurricane Irene, August 20th through the 29th, over 7 billion and fit around 50 deaths. People dead, you know. Upper Midwest flooding, the Missourians, Missouri's rivers overflowed in Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, and Missouri. Damages 2 billion. Mississippi River flooding, spring and summer, damages neared 4 billion. Drought and heat wave in Texas, Oklahoma, over 5 billion. Tornadoes in Midwest and Southeast in, in May kill 177 and cost more than $7 billion in losses. And it goes on. I'm not going to read the rest of these things, but it's just more and more death and huge amounts of money being spent on this. these disasters that hit after our government is telling the Jews to give up their land. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. So I need to see scientific proof that the Bible is true. If you haven't seen it by now, I don't know what to say for you. You say, Brian, why are you so adamant about attacking Stephen Anderson? Because he's trying to bring God's curse on this nation. Him and the other replacement heretics, replacement theology heretics, all the Catholics that are out there, and you got guys like Tex Mars and, and some of these other crazy nuts, They're trying to bring God's curse on this nation. Don't mess with the nation of Israel. And I'm going to keep showing it here in this study. Next we're going to go to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32 verse 27. I'm going to show you more about this whole thing. Genesis chapter 32, verse 27 through 28. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. Now look at this. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Here you have Jacob wrestling with the angel. But Jacob's name is changed to Israel. So whenever you see Jacob, from here on out, it's synonymous with Israel. Israel and Jacob. That's why in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, it says the time of Jacob's trouble. That is, means the time of Israel's trouble, about the coming time period that people call the Great Tribulation. That's not actually a title that's found in your King James Bible. The Bible nowhere says the Great Tribulation as a title. It's a description. Then shall there be Great Tribulation. Immediately after the great tribulation or the, the tribulation of those days, excuse me, it's a description, but it's never a title. And you say, well, what's the importance of that? Because the actual title of that time period tells you who it's for. The time of Jacob's trouble, not the churches, not the bride of Christ, Jacob. And that's why these replacement theology heretics have to steal God's promises and God's plan for the Jewish people, for that nation of Israel, Jacob. That's why they do it. Next, go to Exodus. Exodus chapter 2. Continue on here with our study on the Jewish people. And, you know, I mean, I can't possibly cover everything here. And there's just so much we could go over in this study. I'm just kind of trying to hit the main points. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 through 25 says here, And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and look at this, And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect 
unto them. Hmm. Here they are down in this heathen place. They were forced to go there because of the drought and everything, this famine. Uh, when Joseph was down there in Egypt, he told them to come down there, and they're down there, and then now they're starting to really reproduce, and they're starting to get bigger and bigger as a nation. And that good Pharaoh that was around when Joseph was around, he died, and now a bad guy came along, and now he's using the Jews as slaves. And God doesn't look down there and say, well, sorry, that covenant, you know, I, I just kind of kind of talked it over with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, but you guys, eh, you're on your own. He didn't do that. He remembered his covenant. Why? Because it's everlasting. It didn't go away. Nor will it ever go away. We'll see that as we continue. Exodus chapter 4. Exodus 4 verse 22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn, and I say unto thee, lest my son, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Hmm. You say, well, what was, uh, what was Pharaoh? Pharaoh was a descendant of Shem. No, Pharaoh was a descendant of Ham. Pharaoh was a Hamite. Okay? And you, before you, if you're, if you're African or, or of the descendants of Ham, and, and you get all upset at me and everything, I'm a descendant of Japheth, okay? So my ancestors are not in the godly line either, all right? Keep that in mind. God chose one group, the descendants of Shem, and one particular kindred within that group. See, God's very narrow-minded when it comes to things like that. God says, I'm going to provide one way of salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to provide one book for you if you speak English. You know, why would God need to provide a book, a new book every year? That's kind of confusing. See? That's not the God of the Bible. God says, that's the way it's going to be. That's it. And you see, there are covenants that He made with different people, and there are different things that He set up and things like that, and they're not always everlasting. Sometimes God makes an agreement with certain people and says, okay, well, you know, you're going to do this unless you disobey and whatever. But he didn't say that with the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is everlasting. And it doesn't matter what the Jews do. It is everlasting. It's a promise that God made. And I'm going to show you later on, these people say, well, the Jews are, are in unbelief right now, so their, their covenant is disannulled or whatever else. No, 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 no. They're supposed to come back in unbelief to their land. God brings them back in unbelief before they get saved. I'm going to show you the scriptures to prove that, which no replacement theology heretic will cover. They don't dare talk about it. But let's uh, continue here. Exodus chapter 6, verse 4. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers, and I have, have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Well, you see, Brian, it's just a covenant that's a spiritual promise. Uh, to give them the land of Canaan, physical real estate. And it's so funny to me because these replacement theology heretics None of them care about the physical land that God gave or that God promised to the children of Israel. Well, except for the Vatican. They're trying to get their 30 feet into the you know, city of Jerusalem, which is going to be prophecy being fulfilled, you know, because you have the false prophet there, you know, and I'm going to, I believe that he's going to give his power to the, you know, or support the Antichrist. And I think that the Antichrist is going to be a, a counterfeit for Jesus Christ, what, at least what people think Jesus Christ is like. Um, but the false prophet, I believe, is the either this pope or the next one. Not really sure when the timing of this whole thing is going to happen. But I believe that it's going to be the ultimate PR campaign because you're going to have the Antichrist showing up and the pope, being the false prophet, is going to take off his crown and he's going to place it on the head of the Antichrist. And then he's going to bow down and all the papists are going to bow down with him and everybody's going to go, oh, Jesus return, Jesus return. Mm-hmm. I won't be here, but uh, 
because of the pre-trib rapture, you know. Right now, all the uh, Andersonites are, are doing cartwheels and falling on the floor and foaming and weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth and and chewing on their tongues and things in utter disbelief that any serious preacher could believe in the pre-trib rapture. It's heresy. It's been debunked. 1830 was the first year it was taught. And, yeah. <laughs> I have no time for post-tribbers, man. I mean, give me a break. I've debunked their stuff for years and years and years. There are no good arguments for the post-trib rapture. Give me a break. Next, we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 20. You know, I learned a long time ago that people that really want the truth, they'll search for it. If you really want the truth on the rapture, you'll search for it. You can go to my channel. You can see all the good sermons and things that are out there on it. I've answered all the arguments. But uh, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 24 through 26 says here, But I have said unto you, Ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. Ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, and between unclean fowls and clean, and ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground which I have separated from you as unclean. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. Speaking to physical people. Not spiritual. There's neither Jew nor Gentile in the body of Christ. We're all Christians. We're all one. No, 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 no. That's not who he's talking to there. He's talking to physical descendants of Abraham. Going back to Shem. To the exclusion of Ham and Japheth. God severed them. Not only did he sever Shem from Ham and Japheth, he also severed an even smaller group out of Shem. The Orientals are over this way, the Indians are over this way, and God says, the Jews, they're my people. I made a covenant with them. And notice, how did it start? It started with Abraham. How many sons did Abraham have? Just one. So all those different brothers, you know, they can't all say, you know, hey, wait, I'm, I'm the descendant of Abraham too, and I'm the descendant. You say, but Brian, there is another descendant of Abraham. Yeah, but it was from a Hamite woman, Hagar, an Egyptian handmaid. And if you read in the book of Galatians, it says that the son of the bondwoman will not be heir with the son of the free woman. Yes, Abraham had two sons, but the one was not by promise. The one had nothing to do with that physical promise to inherit the land. So the Arabic people of today are part of that line of Ishmael. And you say, well, then they're cursed people. No, they're not a cursed people. They can get saved just like you or, my, or me can get saved. Japheth, Ham, whoever. Anybody can get saved today. God's no respecter of persons. God will save a Jew just as quick as he'll save a Chinaman, just as quick as he'll save an African, just as quick as he'll save somebody from Northern Ireland or, or wherever. Arab, the most Muslim person out there, whatever, God will save you. He'll do it. He's no respecter of persons today, spiritually speaking. But he's not done with the physical line of the Jewish people. I'm going to keep showing you that as we continue through the study. Turn next to Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus 26 verse 7 through 9. And ye shall chase your enemies, and shall and they shall fall before you by the sword. And five of you shall chase an hundred, and an hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. For I will have respect unto you, and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and establish my covenant with you. Wait a second. God made the covenant, but now he has to establish it? How does he establish it? By good, independent, fundamental Baptist churches preaching the word and getting souls saved. Is that, why, is that how he's doing it there in the Old Testament? No, God's establishing his covenant with the children of Israel by military conquest. You see, when you go back to the Old Testament, you're dealing with the physical descendants fighting for physical land. 
There's nothing spiritual to it. There's no, well, we can spiritualize the passage because Jews actually mean he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, but he is a Jew which is one inward. No, 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 no. In the Old Testament, we're dealing with the physical line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob being Israel. You got to get a hold of that thing. You say, but uh, none of this stuff matters, Brian, because it's all been done away with in the New Testament. Oh, no, it hasn't. And I'm going to show you that. Next, we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 26, verse uh, 42 through 46. And it says here, Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember. And I will remember the land. The land also shall be left of them, and shall enjoy her Sabbaths, while she lieth desolate without them, and they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity, because even because they despise my judgments, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet for all that, and notice this, notice this, in verse 43, they're, they're in sin, they're messing around. Look at this, verse 44, And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. That's what the Lord's saying. I didn't mean to point at me there. <laughs> you know, I'm not the Lord. These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Wait a second. The teaching of replacement theology says that the Jews are in sin right now. They have the, the Babylonian Talmud and they, and they have the Kabbalah and they do these evil things and they have legal prostitution. Always amazing how the American Christians can say this and, the, and other people too, and yet they... Their own country is doing the same things, but yet somehow we're God's nation and Israel isn't. Yeah, a little bit of hypocrisy there. But the fact is, they say, oh, look at all these bad things that Israel's doing, so therefore, they're not in belief. They don't get the land. Oh, uh, wrong. Right there, we just read it. We just read it. God's covenant, he remembers his covenant in spite of what the Jews are doing. Why? Because God made a promise and God cannot lie in spite of what you heretical replacement theology losers are trying to say. You want to get me mad? <laughs> Start talking against the Jews. All right? I've been invited into the Jewish kindred by the seed of adoption, the spirit of adoption. I'm not going to speak against my family that I've been born into. I, can, I count it a great honor to have been born into the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, through salvation. Salvation is of the Jews. Why on earth would I speak against the Jews? My Savior is a Jew. You read in the, in, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the saints in heaven. They're saying, hallelujah. You know what hallelujah means? Okay, or, or rather, what language hallelujah is? It's Hebrew. I'm going to be a Jew in heaven. I'm going to be speaking Hebrew in heaven. Why would I speak against the Jewish people? And I'm the heretic because I take stands for the nation of Israel. Sure, right. Next we're going to go to Numbers chapter 22. Numbers 22, uh, verses 9 through 12. Here's another good one. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, hath sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come up or come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Hmm. Remember, God said to Abraham, I'm going to multiply thy seed. They're going to be a great nation. It says here, Come now, curse me them. Peradventure, I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. So here you have this, this king of Moab, there, Balak, here, and he's saying to Balaam, hey, 
curse these Jewish people. Curse them, because I want to go. I want to just drive them out of here. Curse them. Look what he says. Look what well, actually. Look what God says. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. Hey, Christian, if you're watching Stephen Anderson, let me give you a little bit of advice that comes from the mouth of God right there in that verse. Verse 12, And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them, thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. You better shut your mouth when it comes time to curse the nation of Israel. You say, well, they're in sin, they're in sin. So is our country. So are the other countries. You better shut up when it comes to cursing the nation of Israel. You say, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. I'm going to stand back and let the Lord take care of you. Let's continue. Leviticus, or Numbers chapter 22, verse 19. Jump down to verse 19. He says, uh, did that right? No, I'm sorry, 23, 19. Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? God's not going to lie. He made an everlasting covenant, didn't he? Absolutely. Look at verse 20. Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not be beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. So, the nation of Israel there is compared to a young lion that slaughters its victims. Why? Because it's a Physical people fighting for physical land by military conquest. And it's not over yet. We're going to go next to Numbers 24, verse 9. It says here, He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. What did I read back in the book of Revelation about uh, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah? Hmm. Well, you see, Brian, Judah is actually a reference to Faithful Word Baptist Church in Arizona. Yeah, sure. You know, I, I believe you there. I'm, I'm right in line with you. You know, cuckoo, cuckoo. Hey, man, if you're replacement theology... You say, I've replaced the Jews? Then get yourself over to Jerusalem and take over. Go on over there by military conquest and get the land that God promised to you. What are you doing living in America? What are you doing living in the UK or wherever else you're at? Get yourself to Jerusalem. Strange system that those people have. Trying to steal the promises from the nation of Israel, but they don't want the land. Because you got to fight for the land, you know. And they don't want to fight, you know. Next, we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 9. It says here, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, Hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the land from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt? 
Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments until the New Testament comes in. And then the nation of Israel is done away with and it's Christians now. Oh, wait a second. It's not in there like that. I keep reading the Stephen Anderson version or Tex Mars or any other replacement theology heretic. No, it says, uh, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Well, let's see. What's a generation? Well, there are different numbers that you can come up with. Some say 20, some say 40, some say 60, whatever. But let's just go with the least number. 20 generations. A um, thousand times 20 would be 20,000 years. Um, I don't think it's 20,000 20, years from the time God made the covenant with Abraham until today. Uh, not by a long shot. We're still not even at 6,000 years. Hmm. So, uh, the covenant hasn't been disannulled. It's still there. still in effect. Why? God's not looking down at the Jewish people and saying, I just love you people. You're just my favorite people in the whole world. I just love you. Just love everything about you. That's not why he keeps his command, or why he keeps his covenant. Excuse me. He doesn't look down and say, you people are perfect, sinless people. You're always doing right before me. You never sin. That's why I keep my covenant. You know? Uh, no, that's not why. You know why? Because he made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, and to their descendants. Physical descendants. That's why he keeps it. God is not a man that he should lie. You can't trust a man when it comes to promises. Some guys, I made an agreement, a special agreement and everything else. Yeah, and then he breaks it later on. God's not that way. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2. Turn there next. Deuteronomy 14, verse 2 says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord hath chosen thee, thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. Are the Jews a peculiar people? Oh, sure. If you've ever met an Orthodox Jew, they are very peculiar. Um, go next to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 8 and 9. It says here, When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. There are 12 natural boundaries, in other words, here in our world. 12 natural boundaries. And you say, well, all the nations are of one blood, brother. Well, read the rest of the verse. And God has set the bounds of their habitation. Acts chapter 17. You've got to read the whole thing. Okay, ties in perfectly with right here, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. But look at verse 9. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Well, wait a second now. Now we have a new aspect entering into this thing. Because now you see, it isn't just God made this covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants, their physical descendants for physical land. No, now there is another thing coming into play here. You see, when God gives a child to a couple, that child does not belong to the couple. It belongs to God. God says the joy of the womb is my reward. God is the creator. He says that child belongs to me. You raise that child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That child belongs to me. All creatures, everything on the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything. You see... I can say right now, as an example, the bookshelf and all that in them is, the fullness thereof belongs to me. Okay? Now, it's God's. He owns everything. But the fact of the matter is, these are all my books. God looks at the earth and he says, all that stuff down there, it's all mine. But notice what he said there about that land and those people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Whose inheritance? We're going to see.
And here's another very, very clever little thing that these replacement theology heretics like to do. They're not only changing God's word, questioning God's word, but they're also trying to steal something from the Lord himself. Let's continue. Next, we're going to go to 1 Kings. Jump over to 1 Kings chapter 10. First Kings chapter 10, verse 9. It says, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee, to set thee on the throne of Israel, before the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore he made thee king to do judgment and justice. Hmm. So there's a throne in Israel? Huh. Do you think that there might be some kind of a future need for that throne? A future prophecy fulfillment? For the throne in Jerusalem? If you know your Bible, you know where I'm going. Okay, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 36. Go over there. And unto his son will I give one tri uh, tribe, that David my servant may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen to put my name there. Jerusalem the city of peace, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. But there's no tie-in. It's all symbolic. It's, it's, it's poetic. It's poetry. Jewish poetry. Isn't it beautiful Jewish poetry? It's literal. And in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus is talking about you know, the Sermon on the Mount and everything, he says that you're not to swear about anything, and he says, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Is Jerusalem the city of the great king today? No. Was Jerusalem the city of the great king when Jesus was physically present the first time? No. Well, then we don't have to worry about it. It's never going to be. Wrong. There's a future fulfillment. Jesus Christ rules and reigns from that city for 1,000 years. Why? Because it's his inheritance. And these replacement theology heretics try to steal it from the Lord. Now, some of them don't go that far. Some of them don't go the whole way that the Catholic Church does. See? But many of them do. That's why it's dangerous. And, of course, the ones that don't, they're just ignorant of the whole significance of their system that they've been duped into believing. But let's continue. Second Chronicles chapter 6. Go over to Second Chronicles chapter 6. 